Hello and welcome to the New Republic Salon. I'm Laura Marsh, I'm the literary editor of the New Republic, and today I'm talking with Jacqueline Rose about her new book on violence and on violence against women. Jacqueline, thank you so much for coming. Ah, oh, you're on mute. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. I'm sure that will be our last technical glitch in this whole, this whole uh, conversation. Um, so we are going to hear from the book and discuss it. And at the end, um, for people in the audience, there will be a question and answer section. So if you have a question for Jacqueline at any point during um, the time we're talking, there's this Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and you can just leave a question in there. And at the end, when we have the question and answer section, I'll ask them. Um, so why don't we just get straight into the book? Do you wanna read from the book and, and obviously feel free to introduce it a little bit. Okay, well, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me on this series, which I know is much esteemed and listened to and appreciated uh, for what you do and the kind of attentions that you pay to certain types of writing in these difficult times. So I'm going to read from the introduction to the book, um, which I think will give you a sense of its overall orientation and what it's trying to do. Um, and I'm happy to talk about everything from the title to anything else you want to discuss, obviously, when we open up. And the book starts with two epigraphs. And one is from Albert Camus' The Plague. And he says this, the evil that is in the world almost always stems from ignorance. The most hopeless vice being ignorance which believes it knows everything and therefore grants itself the right to kill. The soul of the murderer is blind and there is no true kindness or loving and being loved without the utmost far-reaching vision. And he wrote that in 1947, shortly after the end, of course, of the Second World War. And then the second quote is of a rather lower <laughs> quality, but seemed to me to be very representative of one strand of the celebration of male violence that is going on at the moment. And it's words from Jair Bolsonaro, who, as you will know, is the president of Brazil, who made a public statement on COVID-19 on, COVID on the 30th of March, 2020. And he said, we are going to tackle the virus. He'd been challenged for not paying enough attention or taking the appropriate measures. We are going to tackle the virus, but tackle it like fucking men. Okay, and then the book begins. It is a truism to say that everyone knows violence when they see it. But if one thing has become clear over the past decade, it is that the most prevalent insidious forms of violence are those that cannot be seen. A group of identical looking white men in dark suits are photographed as their president signs an executive order banning US state funding to groups anywhere in the world offering abortion or abortion counseling. The passing of this global gag rule in January 2017 effectively inaugurated the Trump presidency. The ruling meant an increase in deaths by illegal abortion for thousands of women throughout the developing its world. Its effects have been as cruel as they are precise. No non-governmental organization in receipt of US funds can henceforth accept non-US support or lobby governments across the world on behalf of the right to abortion. A run of abortion bans followed in conservative Republican held US states. And in November, 2019, Ohio introduced to the state legislature, a bill which included the requirements that in cases of ectopic pregnancy, doctors must re-implant the embryo into the woman's uterus or face a charge of abortion murder. Ectopic pregnancy can be fatal to the mother and no such procedure exists in medical science. At a talk in London in June, 2019, Kate Gilmore, the UN Deputy Commissioner for Human Rights, described US policy on abortion as a form of extremist hate that amounts to torture of women. Quote, we have not called it out in the same way we have other forms of extremist hate, she said, but this is gender-based violence against women, no question. Now the resurgence of hate-fueled populism has become a commonplace of the 21st century. 
but it is perhaps less common <coughs> to hear extremist hate, notably against women, being named so openly as the driver of the supreme legal machinery of the West. Now, judging by that original photograph, which has become iconic of 21st century manhood in power, the White House officials might just as well have been watching the president sign off on anything. They looked as bland as they were ruthless, mildly complacent and bored. No shadow across their brow, no steely glint in the eye or pursing of the lips to suggest that their actions were fueled by hatred. Doubtless they believed that their motives were pure, that they were saving the lives of the unborn. It is a characteristic of such mostly male violence, violence regnant as it might be termed, since it represents and is borne by the apparatus of the state, that it always presents itself as defending the rights of the innocent. These men are killers, but their murderousness is invisible to the world, illegal abortions belong in the, in the back, back streets, and to themselves. Not even in their wildest dreams, I would imagine, does it cross their minds that their decision might be fueled by the desire to inflict pain. Neither the nature nor the consequences of their actions is a reality they need to trouble themselves about. With their hands lightly clasped or hanging loose by their sides, what they convey is vacuous ease. Above all, they brook no argument. Their identikit posture allows for no sliver of dissent, not amongst themselves, not inside their own heads. It is the central premise of this book that violence in our times thrives on a form of mental blindness. Like a hothouse plant, it flourishes under the heady stream of its own unstoppable conviction. Shall I stop there, Laura? Uh, yeah, we can start talking now, I think. Um, so the book talks about many forms of violence against women, um, abortion, uh, anti-abortion laws are one part of it, but you also talk about sexual assault, sexual harassment, the murder of women. Um, the book's title is On Violence and On Violence Against Women, which before you start reading it almost suggests two books, two volumes that have been bound together. And of course the book is really not that, it's very much one book or at least that's the way I read it, um, with themes woven together throughout them. Um, so the first question I have is, why did you title the book in that way? And what is the distinction? What's the distinction you're drawing there? And also what's the relationship? Okay, it was very important to me to have that title because I knew that as a feminist, my main objective was to describe, expose, protest against the increasing prevalence and if not prevalence certainly visibility of violence against women and in some cases the increasing prevalence but I didn't want to fall into what for me would have been a trap which would be to suggest that all violence is violence by men against women I wanted to make it clear that I knew the question of violence exceeded the most obvious and some ways terrifying forms of gender-based violence. And I wanted to say to myself as a kind of challenge, I can get both these arguments on the same page. They're not mutually exclusive. So it's like violence against women is specific and must be named and called, but it is not exhaustive. And we need to understand that there are other forms of violence. And in the introduction, I talk about the worst serial killer in the UK over the last decades was a man who abducted, seduced, and won over young men who he then raped, mutilated, and murdered. So it was very important for me that we don't, as feminists, fall into the trap of saying only violence against women counts, because that also feels like a very problematic thing to do. Plus, of course, um, in relationship to sexual harassment, so much capital is made by people who hate me too and hate the exposure of sexual violence against women. So much capital is made by the few relatively rare cases where a woman has sexually harassed a man that it felt also crucial to say, I can take that into my purview but it doesn't change a word of what I'm saying about violence against women. Right. Um, and in many ways, what you're writing about is gender and violence, though a lot of this gendered violence happens to women. Would that be right? 
Well, gender is a, <laughs> how long have we got? Gender is a complicated <laughs> term as everybody will know. And I think I'm actually as often as not talking about something not quite gender, but sexuality and violence. I'm because I'm talking about the subterranean channels of the psyche in which violence mutates and transforms itself and becomes licensed and permissible. And I feel that that has something to do with the Freudian unconscious, the things that people can and cannot bear to think about themselves, because it is a central argument in the book. I use Hannah Arendt's uh, expression that there are the, re the real there are realms in which man cannot act and which he cannot change and which he therefore has a distinct tendency to destroy. And that is an account of gender, obviously, i.e. this is how men are encouraged to behave, but it's also an account of the kind of internal pulsionality that drives people to behave in certain ways because of what they can't bear about themselves or what they can't bear about the world. So I think it adds another dimension. So it is gender, of course it is mm -hmm. gender violence against women, but it also has something else going on as well. Uh, well, going back to the idea of there being several traps in writing about this subject, and which I think you navigate with incredible nuance and complexity in the book, uh, which is one of the reasons I want to talk to you about it. But the, tra the traps here, one of them is that when you start talking about violence against women, uh, when one starts talking about violence against women, a lot of people can tend to um, insist that this is how men are and this is how women are. And um, this is something that you engage with, I think, pretty early in the book. And I would love for you to just talk more about um, the difference between men and masculinity and how masculinity um, can be at the root of a lot of the violence that you're writing about um, and how as feminists we should be critiquing masculinity. Well, like where are the pitfalls? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I like what you said because it's absolutely central to me that feminism thrives on the gap between what women are expected to be and what they feel they potentially could be. And it thrives, it's only possible because of the refusal by feminists to embody the way the culture demands them to see themselves. That's what a political revolutionary mov movement is. It says, as things are, they are unacceptable to us, which must mean you have a voice which has partially escaped the curse. Because if you didn't have that voice, you wouldn't be able to say it. So I've said this before, but I'll, I'll say it again. I say it in the book, which is what I always say to my students is, if we didn't have patriarchy, if patriarchy wasn't effective, we wouldn't need feminism. But if it was 100% effective, we wouldn't have feminism. So I am in argument with a number of feminist positions which make me deeply uncomfortable because I do believe that if we allow that gap as the beating heart of feminism between what we're expected to be and what we potentially are, and in fact, what we are on a day-to-day -day basis when we hate what we're expected to be, we have to allow that same gap to men. We have to allow that for many men, masculinity is a curse that they are never equal to. And in proportion to them not being equal to, they are enraged. So it's not that violence by men is an enactment of masculinity in its ideal form. It's a rage against the impossibility of fulfilling the masculine ideal. And therefore we've got to allow for the fact that both men and women are capable of transformation. If you don't allow that gap between maleness, masculinity and men and femaleness, women and femininity, then I think we're really completely scuppered. There's nowhere to run. So that's a central part of the argument. What I liked about your formulation of this gap between women and femininity or the ideas of what traditional femininity and men and masculinity is that there's some hope in that gap between men and masculinity. Some men don't want to perform traditional masculinity and look for ways to liberate themselves from that construct. But at the same time, I think you're also talking about men who are in tension with their masculinity, trying to act it out, and that, that leads to forms of violence. 
Well, for me, an absolutely two, I know we're going to come on to Oscar Pistorius, but two glaring examples of what you just talked about, Laura, would be Harvey Weinstein and um, Oscar Pistorius. And for me, a key moment in the Weinstein case was when he appeared in crutches, on crutches, on his way to the courtroom, as if he was actually displaying the fragility, which his whole sexual performance for the last two decades at least was designed to occlude and to hide. He now wanted to exploit it for a sympathy vote to get his sentence reduced. But there was also that other moment in the court when people handed round, one of his abusees said he lacked testicles and they passed pictures around the courtroom to examine his genitalia the issue is not whether he lacked testicles or not. The issue was that in a trial, which was about what could be seen as the most cliched, dominant, violent, worst form of masculinity, that it confirmed and it was going to sentence and judge, a completely different image of masculinity erupted in the courtroom where the body does not know its own limits. It cannot even stand up, let alone be erect. So I was really interested in the way in which even the most apparent cliche form of masculinity has a fault line running through it or can be seen to be. And I know we're gonna get onto Pistorius later and that was certainly true of him. But when you were just talking, Laura, and you said some men can't bear to be men, I thought you were gonna start talking about trans women because <laughs> if there are men who can't bear to be men, it has to be trans women which is to say they have repudiated the masculinity on offer. So Jane County, for example, says she would sit there as a young boy tearing up, which is really interesting actually, tearing up the images in magazines for men of nude women. And she, he knew that was what he was expected to become and he absolutely hated it and wanted to reject it. So I think that's a really important example of a, ho a whole group of men in our culture whose sole desire is to repudiate their own masculinity because they think it's disgusting. I wanted to talk a bit actually about the way you draw on a lot of trans writers in the book. There are several chapters where you make a study of um, trans writers and it, it, that felt important in a book that is called on violence and on violence against women because um a very like another trap would be to exclude trans women and that trans people more generally from a discussion of that subject um and your book is is doing the opposite of that it's kind of trying to create this very inclusive um understanding of violence in general, I think, and, and gendered violence and violence that um, is a, coming from sexuality. Um, and in many ways, you're reacting against or responding to radical feminists who want to keep those voices out of this conversation. Um, do you think that that legacy of radical feminism has made all of this much harder to talk about? I think it's made it toxic. I mean, I think it's been absolutely foul the way some what are called TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists, have talked about trans women as if they were, in the words of Jermaine Greer, pantomime dames, or in the word of Janice Raymond, the transsexual empire, it's in the title, right, um, are actually rapists. Okay, so for, for Janice Raymond, um, a transsexual woman is the best emblem we have of patriarchy because he has been willing to relinquish his genitalia to penetrate, to enter, to colonize, to control the world of women. Um, and I, I always think it's quite funny because in psychoanalytic thinking, the phallus and the penis are not the same thing. I mean, the penis is a, is a part of the body that can and cannot perform. The fallacy is a fantasy of permanently erect, powerful, masculine self-membership, right? That's, that's what the fallacy is. It's very hard to distinguish those things when you're talking to students. And for some time now, I've always said to them, well, you know, the best example is Janice Raymond, because according to her, to embody the fallacy, 
you tear off the penis, right? So if ever there was an illustration of the disjunction between the two, i.e. the fragility of the male body as well as its potency and uh, sexual power in the sort of patriarchal social sense, then the male to female transsexual would be the best example. But the other thing I feel very much about this debate is that if you read transsexual writers, and I immerse myself in those texts for well over a year, longer. And in fact, the London Review of Books, where I first published a shorter version of this, of the chapter on the first chapter on trans, didn't like the piece because they, the whole first half of it was all quotations from trans writers. And I said to them, you've got to understand this is political. I do not have the right to say, the editor said, you don't say anything until two thirds, thirds of the <laughs> You don't hear your voice, I said precisely. I had to earn it. I really had to orchestrate their voices first before I had the right to say anything at all. So uh, the more I read of trans women, trans women, the more I found this accusation on the part of trans exclusionary radical feminists completely mm -hmm. incomprehensible to me. I mean, it just seemed to be so damaging and so cruel especially because the, the rate of violence against trans women, especially trans women of color, is so high and way above violence against women in the general population. So um, it seemed to me, it also seemed to me just so sad that feminism and trans women couldn't be seen to have an obvious allegiance because if you read all these texts, they've been on the most incredible journey. They've been through something so complex and so painful and so medically difficult. And the idea that this is just an identity they go and pick off the supermarket shelf is complete bullshit. This is a form of agony. And therefore I think they've got lots to say about what is involved in becoming a woman. And we should be, we so-called cis women, which I don't believe in as a category either, by the way, but so-called cis women should really be listening, listening to them. Right. And um, I want to get back to how the thinking about trans women and hearing from trans women informs um, this broader idea of violence against women and feminism in general, because you're drawing a distinction between, I think, radical feminists who identify with a woman or identify the idea of a woman with someone who is born a woman and, and who experiences violence by men. And it kind of hard, that's a caricature, but it hardens into the idea that women are this group of people who suffer from violence by this other group of people who can't change, which is the sort of like weirdly self-defeating position because if men are stuck with being men and no one can change, then what's the point of feminism? Because what's the point in having a liberation movement if, if we are all essentially trapped in these roles of women being righteous victims and men being stuck with being in, in this performance of toxic masculinity that no one can depart from. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And I feel you've summed up the main sort of ethical impetus of the book and what I'm trying to argue. And it's an argument with a certain strand of feminism. I mean, I think that radical feminist position is deadly. Um, as do I think the idea that all women are best seen as victims. And I've also said this elsewhere in relationship, oddly, oddly enough, to the conflict in the Middle East, but we're not going to go down that path. Which is that'd be a whole other event. <laughs> that would be a whole other event, another time perhaps. But victimhood is something that happens to you. It's an event. It's a moment. If you turn it into an identity, psychic or political, I think you're finished. I really do, because it then becomes it. It then. I mean, in fact, that is the effect of trauma, that from then on, you can only see yourself as a victim. So when JK Rowling says, for example, I was abused, I want a woman only place because I don't feel safe in the company of all these women. If one man comes in who hasn't had the surgical transition, right? And therefore, as far as she's concerned, is a complete fraud, not maybe sexuality is ambiguous, but is a complete fraud. She has turned every potential man who could walk into that space into a violent rapist or abuser. Now, not only do I not think that's true about all men, because it would be a disaster in the ways you described, but I also think that position is an effect of the trauma she went through, where she sees instead 
the trauma and the victimization she went through gives her access to the truth and it can't be challenged. So I think there's something very complicated going on here, but I couldn't agree with you more, Laura, about needing the space in which masculinity can question itself. So there are organizations now called things like Boys Won't Be Boys or Bands of Brothers, which are working with young boys to really help them renegotiate what it means to be a man. And an example in the book, which I'm very attached to, is the case of the little 12-year-old boy who Melanie Klein analyzed in the middle of World War II, who was obsessed with Hitler daddy and pigsty mummy, and Hitler daddy hitting on pigsty mummy. So he was describing a scene of sexual abuse, domestic abuse. We have no way of knowing whether it was real or imagined. In the middle of war, World War II, you wouldn't need it to be real in your home to be able to imagine it, right? Because that's what Hitler was mm -hmm. doing. He'd certainly conflated Hitler and daddy. And he makes a wonderful slip at one point where he says he knows his blows. And he means he blows his nose, but he says he knows his blows. And what he's saying is he knows he's capable of rage. He knows he's capable of anger. And what he's trying to discover through the analysis is whether he has to embody that, whether he has to become Hitler daddy or pigsty mommy. Are they the only options on the cards? And it's very moving to watch it because what he's struggling for is anger against the lies of Ribbentrop. He's very clear about that. He's so smart, this kid. But also anger against what is being played out in the world as an expectation on him. So it's like what Melanie Klein shows in the analytic setting is there's always everything to play for. And there is a also because, of course, for Freud and Klein, children are originally bisexual. They haven't yet been slotted into the definitive sexual role. Freud's famously said the sexual act is an act between at least four people, right? Because we're all <laughs> bisexual in the unconscious. So it's never just two people who know who and what they are. Goodness sake, I hope people who make love don't know who and what they are. That's the whole point is that you lose yourself, okay? So the idea is that sexuality is this very murky area and the culture is saying, line up, be one or the other, and then take on the trappings of identity which the culture requires of you. And this little boy is being made ill by that injunction, as well as by the violence that's being rehearsed across the world. So you've said it better than me. I'll give you one other example, which is the vagina man. This was a man who, who believed he had a vagina, which meant when he was fucking, he thought he was fucking himself and being unfaithful and he could never have a child because he wouldn't know who the father was. Now, before you, don't worry if you didn't follow that because it kind of comes across as completely crazy. But then Juliet Mitchell, who wrote Psychoanalysis and Feminism many years ago, also described the fact that a woman can have the same syndrome. Let's say she can believe that her vagina is a false organ and there's something wrong, but because she looks normal and she's wearing the right clothes and seems to be leading the right domestic life and maybe even has children, you would never know that deep in her unconscious, there's a very complex negotiation of which bits of the body she's attached to, which bits she identifies with and who she most wants to be. So it's central to my piece on trans that, I, in fact, it was called in the London Review of Books, Who Do You Think You Are? And I say that's a question all so-called straight or cis people should be asking about themselves. Who the fuck do you think you are before you start telling everybody else what you think they really are and are not? But yeah, we agree. Um, that's the main message of the book. <laughs> Right. Well, so we're going to talk, we are going to read about uh, the trial of Oscar Pistorius in a moment. And I want to introduce that by saying that it could strike many people that this crime, the killing of Reva Steenkamp by Oscar Pistorius, her boyfriend, is a very straightforward crime committed by a man who was a famous athlete against a woman who was a famous, famously beautiful woman, a model. Um, and, a and, law, the, and a law student, please. Look and, and a law student, yes. Uh, a, a highly intelligent woman who was also, in fact, engaged in feminist activism the week that she was murdered. But this seems to be a very clear case, a case in which gender roles are very clear um, and that we know that he did murder her um, and that the trial was really to find out what he thought he was doing. 
Um, and the chapter of your book in which you write about that really blows open a lot of those categories uh, and many others too. Um, so let's, uh, I know that you have a reading from that prepared and then maybe we can talk a bit more. And I just wanna use this opportunity to remind people in the audience um, that there will be a Q&A at the end. And if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to drop them in. Okay, so this is from the chapter on the trial of Oscar Pistorius, which I just became completely hooked on, like many people did. And the more I looked into it, the more truly bizarre in the ways that you've just suggested, Laura, it turned out to be. So every four minutes in South Africa, a woman or girl, often a teenager, sometimes a child, is reported raped. And every three hours, a woman is killed by her partner. The second figure from a report of 2019 shows how far, fast this violence is accelerating, as it was every eight hours, according to reports from the time of the Pistorius trial. The phenomenon has a name in South Africa, intimate femicide, or as Margie Orford calls the repeated killings of women across the country, serial femicide. According to Cyril Ramaphosa, the president who was elected in 2018, South Africa is, quote, one of the most unsafe places in the world to be a woman. On the 2nd of February, 2013, less than two weeks before Reva Steenkamp was killed, Anine Boyson was raped and murdered in the Western Cape. If the two deaths are mentioned together, it is mostly in terms of the cruel disparity between the neglected black woman's body and that of her glamorous white counterpart, graveyard racism, as we might say. Steenkamp saw things rather differently. For her, violence against women knew no racial bounds. And a week after Boyson's murder, she tweeted a report of her funeral and posted on her Instagram feed a graphic of a man's hand silencing a screaming woman with the words, I woke up in a happy safe home this morning. Not everyone did speak out against the rape of individuals. Of course, that has such an irony given what was about to happen to her. In the final year of her law degree, Steenkamp broke her back in a riding accident. On recovery, she returned to complete her degree and resolved to pursue her dream of becoming a model in the big city. I believe, she said in a blog site interview, I have the ability to fall back into my legal mind under the pressure of my will to succeed. Her legal mind would always be there, even if on the surface she would start to look like and then be treated as a model and nothing else. The law would become the backdrop or invisible companion of her ambition, the joint repost to a life that could have been and was nearly spent in a wheelchair. This was not her first brush with brokenness. According to her cousin, Kim Martin, at the sentencing of Pistorius, which was the only time during the whole trial that the Steenkamp family got to speak, when Reva was a young girl, the family's pet poodle became paralyzed and was going to have to be put down. Reva saved the dog, became its legs, as Martin put it, carrying the animal with her everywhere. Was Steenkamp prey to a fatal identification? Did her compassion for the underdog, underdog literally in this case, play its part in what killed her? One of the most striking things about this trial is that wherever you look, you see bodies that are broken. And near the end of the trial, before the closing arguments, Pistorius's elder brother, Carl, was involved in a head-on car collision which crushed both his legs below the knees. The link to his brother is surely as glaring as it appeared to be unspoken leaving it unclear whether he would live or ever walk again. In fact, he recovered speedily enough to make it into the courtroom in a wheelchair in time for the verdict. Judge, victim, perpetrator. The lines of the case, the positions could not be more clearly drawn. It was never in question, as Laura just said, that Oscar Pistorius had fired the four shots that killed Reva Steenkamp. There was no judgment to be passed on whether he had committed the act. He had. Instead, the question was, by Judge Masipa's own account, entirely subjective. What was going on inside the mind of Pistorius when he shot through the bathroom door? Everything hung on that question. Did he know he was shooting Reva Steenkamp? Or did he believe it was an intruder, as he claimed more or less from the moment it happened, and certainly to the friends and the police who were the first at the scene of the crime? And if we believe him, big if. <laughs> 
Then did he know he might kill the person on the other side of the door and shoot anyway? In the words of Masipa, did the accused foresee the possibility of the resultant death, yet persisted in his deed, reckless whether death ensued or not? If he did, he would be guilty under South African law of the crime of dolus eventualis, which falls short of premeditation, but which still counts as murder because the possibility of death is foreseen. Masipa's dismissal of this possible charge against Pistorius was at the heart of the legal disputes around her verdict and formed the basis of the subsequent appeal. This famous trial sits at the crux of violence in our times. First, because a woman was killed by a man in the privacy of a home. It is therefore a case of justice for women. Secondly, because it contains at its core questions of race and disability, which have been the focus of so much discrimination and hatred. And finally, because the trial turned crucially on intent by Masipa's account on what could only be subjective, forcing the law to enter the deepest, most intransigent and sometimes deadly recesses of the mind. Um, well, as that last sentence highlights, this is kind of the perfect case for a writer who's using psychoanalysis to talk about gender, sexuality, justice, because uh, courtroom is probably the least appropriate place to probe what goes on in the deepest recesses of an individual's mind, because court cases are all about constructing very hardened stories and trying to put forward a version of reality rather than to actually describe the complexity of that reality. So there's the kind of disjunction between all of the evidence that came out here and the way it can actually be used in the courtroom. Um, I wanna just establish for the audience what happened in the, the basic contours of the crime were that Reva Steenkamp was in her bathroom and that Pistorius shot through the door and she was killed. Um, and that his defense was that he thought that this was an intruder, that it wasn't her. Um, I think what's interesting, particularly about the way you describe the case or the way you discuss the case is on its face, it's very obviously the killing of a woman by a man. Um, but his defense raises this other dimension of the case, which is if he thought he was killing someone else, and it's not clear he actually thought that, but this is a story that's put forward in court. This person is an intruder who is imagined as black. So it becomes, it becomes this kind of weird, almost Schrodinger's cat of a case where it's either a crime against a woman or a crime against a black man. And the way it's constructed in court is that if it were a crime against a black man, that would somehow be an exoneration of Oscar Pistorius which in, in many ways is kind of the most shocking conclusion about this. Yeah. Well, Margie Orford, who's a wonderful journalist and known as queen of crime in South Africa, she's also a crime writer. She said, um, whoever was on the, on the, in the toilet, if you shoot four times through the wind, through the door, there is going to be a body on that bathroom floor. And if Oscar Pistorius was saying it was an intruder, because in the popular imagination, crime is black crime, gated communities and white privileged environment, then he was shooting a Bantu, a Bantu in the bathroom to use Eusebius's and Mackay's expression for whites who don't want Bantus to share their bathroom, right? The only Bantu who's acceptable in a bathroom for a certain white imaginary is a dead one. Okay, so the scandal was exactly as you say, Laura, that somehow he would be exonerated because he would have had a legitimate fear of intrusion. That would be the argument. What the prosecution had to establish was that he knew he was potentially going to kill someone on the other side of the bathroom door, and it didn't matter who that person was. Hence, dolus eventualis or possible harm. He knew it. So, so much of the trial turned on what he knew and didn't know, but there were two moments, and this is a bit like Harvey Weinstein on his Zimmer frame. There were two moments where Blade Runner, with Corinthians tattooed on his back, who exerts each stride with intent, who strode across the courtroom, right? Whereas Judge Masipa was so riddled with arthritis, she had to have a special chair. So the way this was distributed in the courtroom was remarkable. There are two moments where that image of the highly 
perfectly sexualized white dream couple, which is what they were to themselves and to the world, completely falls apart. And one is that after she was shot, um, four neighbors said they heard the voice of a woman screaming around the time of the shooting. Four witnesses heard it. So it was unequivocally a woman's voice. To get him off, the defense argued that Pistorius, when he screamed, sounded like a woman. That actually it was Pistorius screaming and he didn't know Reva Steenkamp was in the toilet because if she screamed, he would have known she was there. And it's just sort of, it was like surreal because this is meant to be the Blade Runner and they're willing to go to the lengths of saying, well, actually this man sounds like a woman. So better to be like a woman than to be the killer of a woman, right? Which I think we'd all agree with. And then there's another moment which is even more crazy, which is when the defense, who is oddly enough dismantling the image which Pistorius had been led to believe in, which was his own perfectibility and his own strength and his own potency. The defense decide the only way to defend him is to take that down and describe him as a vulnerable, disabled man who was therefore hyper insecure. And that's why he shot Intruder or Steenkamp in the bathroom. So it was really disturbing to just listen to them take apart his image of his own body. And the way Barry Rue, the defense argued it was that he'd been vulnerable all his life, something he had insisted was not true. He'd been vulnerable all his life and in fact, what happened in that moment is that he was like, wait for it, an abused woman over decades who suddenly snaps. So he sounds like a woman. And in fact, in his unconscious, he is a woman. So this was just a case of where sex, race, disability, violence, the whole thing was in that courtroom. It's like a cauldron bubbling away. And then, of course, the lid had to be put back on all of that again uh, in order to pass the verdict. Well, so the, the broader dynamic here is the one that you named earlier of an experience of suffering or victimhood. And in Pistorius's case, it was this experience of being disabled that is then used as a perch from which to enact or excuse violence oneself. Um, that his argument was ultimately that um, because he was so vulnerable, um, because he didn't have his his leg, his prosthetic legs. He was he said that he was on stumps when it happened. That that justified the excessive violence of shooting four times. Um, and this is a dynamic that kind of pops up throughout the book, where people feel so aggrieved that they have to exclude others, or they have to somehow oppress other people, and that it's okay because they're the victim, and that virtue accrues to a victim um, and this this seems to be kind of one of the core problems of, of that you're talking about in the whole book which is that once you make violence visible or suffering visible which is really important to do and hasn't been done in many cases and once you bring it out into the open where do you go from there because one of the places you can go from there is to say I have victimhood status now and everything I do is permitted because I'm acting from a position of having been harmed and everything, it seems like we get trapped there everything is never permitted i mean that has to be the starting foundation of an ethical position which is what's permitted to us must be subject to the most careful scrutiny the book is a plea for thought it's uh, i relate violence to hannah arendt's impotent bigness but also to her concept of a fundamental thoughtlessness under the weight of murderous technology and know-how in the mid 20th century. Um, and there's a, the, the piece on Pistorius ends with the moment where I say, there are guns and there is thinking. And one of the big debates in the courtroom was whether he had time to think or not. And he ties himself in not saying he didn't have time to think, he did it as a reflex, but actually if he'd wanted to kill, he would have earned higher or lower. He ties himself in knots. He defeats himself on this question. But what emerges was that he feels his defense depends on the fact that his mind was suspended. He had no time to, thought, to think. And to that extent, I think he's saying something very profound, which is that the capacity to pay attention to who we are and to think who the person is in front of us, to pause for thought, 
I think makes a, would make a huge, and to think about what it means to be a man and think about what it means to be a woman. This is not a plea for academia. It's a, pl a plea for a space of critical thought within the culture where everything can be questioned. And as I said earlier, I think to claim the state as a victim as a license to perpetuate violence is to just be on a vicious cycle, which will be by definition never ending. And there is one piece in the book where I felt I fell almost into the trap of laying out a litany of abuse. And that was the piece at the border with which the book ends on the sexual abuse and harassment of women, who, women migrants. And I just wanted to write a piece that said, look at this, listen to this. And then you have to think of the forms of amazing activism that's going on, the calling to attention of this. I'm thinking of Ale Alexandria Otazia Cortez, who's been, went to the border and she was subject to violent sexual memes as a result, but nonetheless, she spoke out. So this then becomes a case for speaking and thinking and thinking critically. And I think I say very near the beginning of the book that violence is a crime of the deepest thoughtlessness. You're not allowed to stop and question what you're doing. You enact it because it's a way of enacting and producing yourself. Um, I think I slightly traveled off from your question. There. But no, we it's, it's a good answer. We've already discussed it. We've, we agree on victimhood. You have to do two things at once. The book says this all the way through. You have to be able to say this happened and it's unacceptable. You know, so for example, I say, I want Weinstein, I wanted Weinstein to go down as long as possible. I want Chauvin to go down as long as possible. On the other hand, I believe sexuality is lawless and you cannot subject it to legal restraint. There's something in it which is unmanageable and that can't be controlled. And trans activists like Dean Spade are now agitating for prison abolition as part of trans struggle because otherwise they see themselves as on the side of a carceral state. So although they want greater sentences for violence against trans women, on the other hand, they don't want to be seen as simply propping up state violence. So one of the things the book is, is a plea to say, for example, the law must act to stop harassment and abuse. Sexuality is lawless. Can we please have both those things on the same page? And can one not exhaust the other? So I, I think my last question, um, and then we're going to go to the questions from the audience, is that this is a complex intellectual exercise that you're asking people to perform. And certainly there are a lot of people who are intellectuals who are not doing it. And so if they were to read this book and act on your advice, that would undoubtedly be a step forward. But I'm wondering how broadly applicable you think it is beyond that sphere, because how, how accessible is it to ordinary people to, to delve into these realms of the unconscious and to hold contradictory ideas in their minds and to, to follow the injunction that you quote, I think several times from Hannah Arendt, which is that we have to stop and think. How, who is that injunction aimed at? Do you it's think aimed, that's it, universal? It's, not an injunction. It isn't, it's a plea, okay, it's a plea. But I would really want to take issue with the way you just framed it, because I think we're all already in the unconscious. We all dream, we make slips of the tongue, we make jokes with so three non-neurotic phenomena Freud talked about, which is to say that we're all implicated in the unconscious. We all have fantasies, we all have dreams, we all have reveries. We all find ourselves having thoughts we would rather not have. We all suffer from guilt. All I'm asking for is a more psychologically attuned culture, which would say that's all okay. What's not okay is your attempt to resuppress that to make yourself innocent of all violence, project it onto somebody else who you then have the right to kill. That's the dangerous move. That's very simple what I'm saying. And I don't think this is such, I mean, I have to tell you what you're saying, Laura Taha, but I don't think this is a particularly academic book because, you know, the men signing, signing in the gag rule and Oscar Pistorius and women being abused at the border, anybody, and Oscar, anybody can relate, and Harvey Weinstein, I like to think anybody can relate to that. Um, and I'm just adding another twist mm -hmm. to the discussion. That's what I like to think, but we'll see from the, the questions. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, okay, questions. Um, let's see, there's, there's a great question here because I know that you talk about this in your afterword. Um, 
New York City is reporting a market increase in reported rapes in 2021. Between the beginning of March through April 4th alone, an unprecedented 54% increase. And some criminal justice experts fear that crime will continue to rise as the city reopens. Blame has been placed on lockdown, bail reform and gang violence. What do you believe is causing the increase in rape and what, if anything, can we do about it? Well, I discussed this in a piece I wrote for Gagosian Quarterly um, in December in relationship to domestic violence. Now, I know that's not necessarily what this question is talking about, but it is all connected. And I do think that, and I wrote about this in my book on mothers, that women are tasked with making the world safe and with carrying the illusion that in our hearts and minds, we can be pure and innocent and loving. And so there's a kind of double injunction on women to sort of protect men, to look after them, to sort of make the home a beautiful place, to even if they're at work, the domestic role falls to women. In a time of pandemic, in fact, at any time, women fail hugely at that task because death has entered the living room. Death has come in and it's everywhere. Bodies are flailing and failing and passing all around us. Nobody is protected from it. And I think this is, bit, is a major trauma of what we're living in the time of plague. And I feel that women are being punished. Uh, well, certainly in lockdown. I mean, on one Panorama program, the guy said, when lockdown was announced by Boris Johnson, he folded his arms and he said, let the games begin, right? Which is to say, you now are locked in. And of course, these are men who also, as one critic has pointed out, are locked in too and feel they're turning into women. So I think the increased violence against women at the moment is a result of a pent up rage about what lockdown has done to so many men, mass unemployment, no prospects, increase in youth crime, but somewhere there's a kind of undercurrent of expectation of what women are meant to do on behalf of everyone. As I say in my book on mothers, that is a lethal and impossible demand. And if you're a mother, you know within five minutes that the world is not just and your mind is not simple. You know it because you have complex feelings about your baby and you know you can't save them from the ills of the world. You know that within five minutes, but you're still meant to make everything lovely, right? So my feeling is that it's all part of this. It's Julia Kristeva, the French psychoanalyst, calls this feminicide because the role of the feminine to sort of hold everything together has fallen apart. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. Uh, thank you to Jacqueline and Laura for this wonderful talk. Would love to know Jacqueline's thoughts about the phenomenon of trans exclusionary legislation regarding sports, women's sports in particular, it and the trial of Casta Semenya are perfect cases to talk about weaponization of female trauma, terror of trans bodies, et cetera. I know that you mentioned Casta Semenya in the book. Um, so over to you. Well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to come up with a satisfactory answer. I would like to know what the questioner thinks about this because I find it very difficult. I was in a discussion with somebody only this weekend who said, well, they do have an unfair advantage. Oscar Pistorius was accused of having an unfair advantage because of the quality of his blades in the Paralympics. And for a while he was barred from performing and then he was let off and he actually got into the normal Olympics and so on. So I feel this is an absolute minefield and I don't have a clear line on it. My overall position is that anybody who makes the transition should be acknowledged and respected as the gender they have come to be. And that even if that produces a lot of confusion around whether with certain kinds of testosterone and everything, they have an advantage, I think that might be the price we have to pay to not produce the inhuman response, which is to re-exclude them. So I would veer in that direction, but I can see it's not straightforward. The question of who has an unfair advantage in sports seems to me uh, kind of a ridiculous one as someone who has always been very bad at sports. <laughs> like, I feel like people who are good at sports have an unfair advantage in sports. Um, That's a brilliant reply. I think you should make it more widely known. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Um, more questions here. Uh, okay, in your writing about Sylvia Plath in Zionism, 
you deal with the phenomenon of the aggressor's identification with the victim and vice versa. The victim's identification with the perpetrator, particularly in the context of the Holocaust. Has research for this book taught you anything new about identification across the divide between victim and aggressor? Wow, well, um, I wouldn't say in relationship to the Holocaust, I'm talk talking about the identification between the victim and the aggressor, unless you mean this, that the per that one of the tragedies of the Middle East is that the genocidal cruelty of the Holocaust has, this must be what you're talking about, has produced the construction of the Middle East of the very definition of nationhood, blood, land, descent, ethnicity, religion, faith, which was the definition of nationhood in Germany from which the Jews had to flee. So there's been a horrible transposition into the Middle East of what I think can be defined as as a form of aggression, to, well, definitely without question, aggression towards the Palestinians. Um, and this cannot be acknowledged. Israel always presents itself as a victim. And I'm not saying something here which Israelis haven't said. So Shulamit Haraven, extraordinary Israeli writer who's not very well known in translation, but she's one of the most famous writers in Israel, writing in the 50s. In, in, in the 80s, she wrote an article, Identity Victim in which she said, Israel has granted to itself, in fact, possesses the identity of victim, which means it can perpetrate any, her word, atrocity as a consequence. Um, and I was just very affected by this kind of internal discussion inside of Israel of the damage that the nation was doing to itself by continuing to think of itself as a victim because it can never see itself as the origins of its own violence. Now that argument carries straight into this book. And I say at the end of the Pistorius piece that if you cannot acknowledge your own violence, then somebody else is gonna to have to take the rap. Marilyn Monroe said, I'm violent, I have violence in me. You know, I mean, it's, it's something that you, you get to know if you go to psychoanalysis. You can't palm it off on other people. I think the world would be perfect if we just got rid of those people because all the aggression lands in them. To give another example, 9-11 right, when Bush said they envy us our freedom, which was a complete inability to see that possibly American, I mean, you might disagree with this, I realize I'm on your soil as it were, American foreign policy across the world in the Middle East and so on was responsible for forms of violence and injustice, which may explain, not excuse what happened in 9-11, but has to be factored in. But of course, newscasters who were raising this issue were told to shut up, that they would be absolutely not the moment to think of America as the source of violence in any sense. So I do think this is part of how the world organizes itself and contributes to the continuation of violence. Plath, I'm not sure I can go there now. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, and so I think, um, you're talking about the idea that in public we have, and especially in news narratives, we have to have very clearly defined victims and very clearly defined aggressors. And we can't ever portray someone as both or, or a power as both. No, we can't, although Primo Levi wrote The Grey Zone in The Drowned and the Saved, in which he insisted we acknowledge the ambiguity. Well, this is why, I mean, it's something I wanted to ask about and didn't have time is that your book really draws extensively on literature as well as talking about news and, and um, opinion writing that's happening as the news is unfolding, you really draw on literature because it's a place where these things can coexist and you can have fantasy and you can have explicit opinion and you can have people occupying many different roles at the same time. It doesn't necessarily have to fit into these clear narratives and clear roles. Even more, I would say, and I realize we're gonna to have to stop, but even more, I would say, that literature is the place where the, not just lots of different narratives, that's for me a bit of a cop-out, Laura. It's actually the tension you've been describing so well of people operating on both sides of the divide. So Emma McBride will be a classic example, a girl is a half-formed thing, where she has been the subject, object of violence, and she goes searching for it. 
and she therefore is exploring the complexity of her relate that is her trauma in a sense that she then becomes compelled by the violence to which she was subjected it's crystal clear she was subjected to violence it's crystal clear that her mind then starts to move in very complex ways uh or temsula Ao. let me just mention the wonderful nagalese writer who tells the story of the nagalese resistance fighter who spent his whole life trying to forget what he did in the forest as a freedom fighter and to write a novel inside the mind of a hero of the community, the Nagalese, in which he is lamenting his own violence is to cover all the goalposts that we've discussed in our discussion today. And I think literature can do that in a way that other forms of writing don't really have a chance to do or the space. Yeah, um, and thank you. I think I think you were quite right to call me out on, on the cop out. And I think that's one of the things I loved about this book is that it really identifies a lot of traps and avoids a lot of them and um, skewers a lot of easy explanations for things. Um, that's all we have time for. There were so many more questions um, I wish I could answer. And I hope that the people who put them in this Q&A have the chance to come back to another event or to put these questions in the future. Um, thank you so much, Jacqueline Rose, for talking with me about your book on violence and on violence against women. Thank you, Laura, you were great. I really appreciate your questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, bye.